Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me and an honor to, uh, to be the program of this, uh, of this jury. We'll start in English. We'll see where it takes us if we move into French. From you. Uh, so uh, we're going to start with uh, a presentation by Sheep uh, on his HDR uh, portfolio, and then we'll move to uh, different questions from uh, the reporters. So thank you very much again for coming and to be Thanks, indeed. I will present you my work on uh, proximity, similar, similarity, and heredity. Um, so those notions formed by informatics to digital humanities. And uh, I will first start with uh, some elements about my career uh, from uh, after the PhD, after the doctorate. Then uh, show how phylogenetic networks can be used to represent uh, heredity. Um, then focus on proximity with both proximity of words in text and chronological proximity of text. Make a little focus on Marceline de Bord Valmor in the third part, and finally conclude and give you elements about my future works, um, the ones which are uh, currently um, planned. So uh, let's first start with uh, my yeah the beginning of my career after the doctorate, which was defended in 2010 in Montpellier. Supervised by Vincent Berry and Christophe Paul. It was inked by Informatics, so that's phylogenetic networks. And the uh, year after, I had, was in a postdoc uh, with uh, Alain Guénoche in Marseille at CNRS at IML, at IML where I worked on uh, graph partitioning. Uh, since 2011, I've been uh, making the conference at uh, Smith University, now called Université Gustave Eiffel, but it was called initially Université uh, Marne Vallée and Paris Marne Vallée. I was lucky to get a delegation scenarios, meaning a full time of research for one semester at Lattice, a uh, laboratory in uh, an actual language processing, let's say, and uh, uh, linguistics uh, in the south of Paris. I uh, was an advisor for open science at the university uh, in 2028 and 2029. And then after the new university was created as well to make some transition about those missions. And I'm also currently a gender equality co-advisor at Université Paris-Est uh, alongside David François. And um, so I was involved in several projects. I'm happy to have some colleagues in the, in the room who were involved in those projects as well. First, mostly in bioinformatics with this green color. Uh, some were international projects uh, with Singapore, Shenzhen, and uh, with colleagues in the Netherlands. Uh, project uh, supervised by Savings Cornavaca in Montpellier. And you see that more recently, it's more uh, projects in digital humanities, let's say, uh, first with Giselle Séjanger, also with uh, Caroline Trotto for the next ones, and uh, still ongoing projects. And I was also a supervisor of some of those research projects, the ones which appear now. So Visiotris, funded by the CNRS uh, for two years, then Cité des Dames, I was a co um, supervisor of this project with Caroline Proto. We had a, a new funding recently by the university, and currently also uh, another PhD in Merlion with uh, Lucien Zhang on other topics than the ones we studied uh, approximately 10 years ago. And these, with all these projects, I supervised several interns, uh, quite a lot actually, uh, until uh, 2023. Last year was a bit more calm, but still one or two. Um, I'm currently supervising one doctoral candidate. So uh, who's in the room? Shuan uh, Dong is now doing a postdoc in Rennes. Uh, Catherine Dominguez was the main supervisor uh, of uh, this PhD uh, experience. Um, I think this. And um, well, both were in uh, NLP, and more in natural language processing. Um, I wouldn't say classical, but uh, yeah, with uh, machine learning tools, etc. Aaron, uh, it's also with the combinatorial approaches uh, and even yeah, more theoretical algorithms. Uh, so with uh, Pierre Boris, he was in the room and he was with the uh, HDR supervisor. Um, and I've also been involved uh, to get uh, uh, some training for super for doctoral supervision. Uh, I was involved in the writing of the Guide du Doctorat with two French associations, Confédération des Jeunes Chercheurs and Chercheuses, and Andes, uh, which was published in 2020, but I put uh, 
English version, which was uh, issued in 2022. So maybe let's start with the rest of science with phylogenetic networks. So the, uh, I continued working on, on this subject after my PhD. Uh, and you see that uh, this is uh, an example, two examples of phylogenetic networks where you don't really see the biology, you see more maths, more abstract structures. And uh, often this is the approach um, I, I'm having. Actually, phylogenetic networks themselves are a model of evolution. So they are a simplification of what really took place between a root considered as the ancestor of all the species. The species, current species are on the leaves of those uh, kinds of trees, but a bit more intricate than trees. You see that those networks have some branches which uh, join together at some point. That's why we don't have the traditional tree evolution described by Darwin, even drawn by Darwin, but a more complex model with those networks. And I, I will talk only today about explicit phylogenetic networks, meaning that uh, you can really interpret all the nodes as possible ancestral species of the current species which are on the leaves. You see here three examples of networks uh, done by other people. Um, to reconstruct those networks. And I did contribute, uh, I will show you, to some problems uh, consisting in uh, reconstructing those networks from the genetic similarities we observe today based on the heredity that the different species uh, uh, encountered. So uh, an important concept in phylogenetic networks is those reticulations or hybrid nodes the nodes with two parents, and um, uh, you see, I show you here a few examples. You know that they are represented in different manners, which also comes from the different uh, explanations from the biology. Either it models hybridization if two species uh, make a new hybrid species, or it can be just lateral gene transfer with only one gene or with several of them. In the case when you see horizontal links like this. And sometimes it can also be recombination. Um, so here you see on this slide that you have lots of different kinds of ways to draw networks, which have appeared actually in the literature. And this is uh, extracted from a website with a gallery of uh, those networks, uh, which was built also at some point with the help of high school students. So it's a, a way to, to make them discover, for example, a breadth first search when they want to uh, transform those networks into a computer science code of them. So breadth first search is a, one of the uh, basic algorithms that we learn when we try to, when we start working on networks and um, on general networks. And so it applies well on those phylogenetic networks. Um, and so we got a, a data set of uh, those networks where we can try our algorithms. Uh, it was published on research and uh, research that I gave recently, so it was made available for everyone to use it. Uh, so how hard is it to reconstruct such a network from the biological data? Uh, it's pretty hard, actually. It's harder than reconstructing trees. For more than 60 years, people have been reconstructing trees. Uh, now we can do this pretty uh, efficiently. Uh, often, problems which were easy on trees become hard on networks. We call it NP-hard in computer theory. Um, some people, uh, colleagues of Ray Nakule and himself, uh, they define what's, what's the problem here. Often it's scalability. Those networks manage to construct them on a few number of um, leaves. But as soon as we have uh, hundreds of leaves, it's no more possible because of this explosion of computation time for uh, large data. So what should we do and what have we done, what has been done in the last 10 years, often we simplify the model. Uh, one way of simplifying the model is considering that there is no gene duplication in nature, no gene loss, no any, um, you know, um, any sorting. Um, and we just uh, have gene trees. I told you earlier, we can reconstruct uh, trees pretty well from genes, and we try to combine them together. So we have two gene trees for two different genes uh, for four species. We consider that the genes are never lost, never duplicated, and we want to bring them together into a network. And uh, one easy way to do this is you put a, a node on top, like the black one here. Then you join all the links with the same name together. 
And this gives you a network that we saw before, but it's a good one because you have lots of hybrid species, hybrid nodes, lots of reticulations. So all the difficult stuff consists in optimizing the number of those hybrid hybrid systems. And uh, so this problem is called the hybridization network problem, and it's an NPR problem. So to reconstruct the network containing all the trees with a minimum number of reticulations. But actually, even checking if uh, a solution is correct, meaning if I have a network and I have a tree, is the tree contained in the network? This is even also an NPR problem. It was proved in 2008. Then in 2010, some authors uh, had some more results. And I worked a, a lot on this in the last uh, 10 years. So I will give you more details. What we have as input is a tree, for example, a gene tree, and a, a genetic network. And we want to know is the tree contained in the network, meaning, so note that they have the same sets of leaves, both of them. Uh, so does the network display the tree? Means, can we remove some arcs from this network to obtain this tree, approximately? Meaning, uh, each arc in this tree will become a path to several arcs in a line in the network. And well, this seems easy in this example. Okay, remove the two red edges and it corresponds. Uh, actually, it's also easy when I present it for Fête de la Science with uh, junior high school students, where we have uh, networks printed on a board. We have a uh, uh, phalangetic tree made of elastic arcs, and we ask them, can you find the tree in the network? And they can, and they get a caramba. But uh, <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, so we always use quite easy instances of, uh, of this problem. So we know there are not so many leaves, not so many hybrid nodes. But you see that after uh, a first paper we published in 2015 with uh, Lu Zhang and other co-authors, Stefan Gerret, Anthony Labar, and uh, Andres Binawan, uh, there were uh, several papers uh, which were published on this topic. This is a diagram extracted from the Who is Who in Phylogenetic Networks the website I started during my uh, doctorate. I continued uh, 10 years after, and in the last two years, due to technical problems, I'm not maintaining it anymore. Uh, we'll see how it goes later. But uh, yeah, it was one of the resources I gave to the community, this bibliographic database. I also built this set of all the, well, most of the classes of phylogenetic networks which were defined in the, in the literature. Each of those uh, blocks represents a family of Phalangetic networks which share a special property. Uh, maybe let's give you where. This one, it's a phalangetic tree. The property is there are no hybrid nodes. Um, there might be other simple ones. Yeah. Gold tree or unicyclic, they only have one hybrid node. Uh, what can we use this for? So, this is on a website where you have all those uh, different families. And uh, the arrow here shows that one family contains another one. Meaning that every, for example, between one and two, every binary feature network is also a binary real stable network. So we have these inclusions property, which are encoded in this website, uh, built also with contributions by two students, Maxime Morgado and Nargis Terrasoli. And um, what, what we can use this for is to deduce that if we have, we know a way of solving a problem on this class. We have an algorithm, then it also works, of course, on the simpler class, on the subclass. Uh, and on the contrary, if we know that the problem is difficult on a subclass, we can use that it will be a fortiori uh, even more than as difficult on a larger class. Uh, so we can deduce uh, different results from top to bottom and bottom to top. For example, if I uh, represent here the results by the paper by uh, von Yersel, Semple, and Steele in 2010. Uh, so you, you have some proofs of hardness, the red ones, of uh, algorithms which work in polynomial time, the green ones. You should see that with pale colors, we can deduce results on other classes. And so you can find this on the website for several problems. Is uh, Do we have an algorithm which is efficient or not? Um, and so this was a state of the art in 2011. Uh, why did I choose this date? Not for this publication, but because uh, Daniel Gusson and co-authors of uh, his books on phylogenetic networks, so Regularov and uh, 
since Karnataka ask or kind of ask the question, uh, is this problem tree containment solvable in polynomial time? So easy to solve on binary reticulation visible networks, don't worry about what it means. But well, they prove that another problem is easy to solve and we naturally wonder, is it the case for tree containment? And uh, so we started working on this with uh, the colleagues I, I named earlier. We had some uh, some hardness results here um, in 2016, and also uh, uh, some polynomial time algorithm for binary nearly stable networks, uh, which are a bit similar to those, but not exactly. You see, they are not even uh, related by inclusion. But well, they managed using our results. I mean, like I say, they it's our two uh, Singaporean colleagues. They managed with another co-author to solve the problem, uh, which was open in 2011. Uh, also, uh, a colleague of ours now, Matthias Vela, he also found an independent proof to show that it's indeed kind of easy to solve the problem on binary reticulation with the both networks. Uh, so you see there has been progress on, on this uh, uh, state of the art since then. Uh, how did we prove such results? One of the key results was to bound the size of the networks, saying that if we have a certain number of leaves, we have n leaves, we can't have a huge network when the network is has a special property. When it's a general network, you can always add some nodes and some arcs on top, but if the network is nearly stable, for example, we proved that we can have at most 26n minus 24 nodes in total when we have n leaves. And uh, again, uh, Andreas and Lushin managed to improve this result to lower this count. Uh, and so you also have this on the website I showed you earlier, where you have bounds on the number of uh, nodes for some classes. Uh, we like counting. So with uh, Mathilde Bouvel and Marepat Mansouri, we also counted how many networks of those families there are, or some of the families, so here it's uh, level one, level two. I didn't you tell. I didn't tell you more about this. It is those uh, networks here. Um, and with the uh, analytic combinatorics technique, uh, we managed to to have some approximate values when the number of leaves is very high. We had the first values. Actually, uh, the kinds of those kinds of techniques involve uh, writing equations like this, the generating function of the of this number of elements. Uh, but yeah, it was pretty fun to work with uh, uh, experts in combinatorics. Um, and uh, we have people in the room, Karine Pivoto, who would be able to make a generator of random networks from this. So it's not only you know pure math, it can also have practical applications if you want to generate networks randomly. Um, I can tell that uh, for tree containment, we also checked uh, with Sims Karnavaka and others, if, it, if when we know the branch length, it makes the problem easier. Basically, not really. It's even hard, but we have some uh, easier problems, uh, what, easier instances in some cases. Um, but we also worked, you know, knowing the size of the, knowing how many networks there are, is useful to do a local search, meaning try to explore all the set of networks. Uh, so it's good to know how big this is. And to explore this set of networks, one way of doing this is to start from one and get to a similar one by just rearranging it, by changing uh, locally uh, some arcs in the network. And we showed how to do this for rooted networks in this paper. Um, one year before, it had been shown how to do this for unrooted networks, so networks where we don't know uh, where the root is. And um, yeah, we had those uh, extra tools here, which help uh, this practical way of uh, reconstructing network, uh, meaning uh, exploring the space of network. Um, so now, now maybe let's uh, go to the second part about uh, proximity of words and proximity of text chronologically uh, with those two visualizations, which I will uh, uh, explain a little bit now. Um, the tree cloud, this was a tool which was built during my uh, doctorate. Uh, so mostly by interactions with Jean Véronis, who sadly passed away in 2013, uh, but also with, uh, for practical applications with uh, Delphine Schutz in the room. And here I show you other works made with the colleagues in several domains. 
So for example, here with William Martinez, who is an expert in digital um, in uh, discourse analysis, uh, we focused on uh, press articles about the mediator health crisis in France. And uh, when we build this week cloud, we are able to interpret what are the different uh, topics that we observe uh, among those articles. And it becomes more interesting, more interesting when we focus on the articles made with agencies, with press agencies, or by journalists who didn't use content from press agencies. Uh, then we can uh, say more interesting stuff about uh, uh, what they talk about, what they focus on. Other example with experts in biodiversity uh, who were involved in the Biodiversa project, uh, so Yves de Guermont and Xavier Leroux. Um, they had this big database of research projects about biodiversity, which are funded by several funding agencies in Europe. And uh, so you see here that Xavier Leroux uh, found out that uh, the sub trees of this tree together words which make sense to him. So he added some uh, labels to those subtrees, uh, some colors as well for ones which are more about biology, for others who are, which are more about uh, uh, social or human aspects about uh, handling di biodiversity, trying to preserve it, and others about uh, methods and models to study. It. And uh, here again, what was interesting in the study is to see how the funding changes uh, from the beginning of the corpus in 2004 to the end of the corpus 2011. And what are also the geographical trends with the difference between countries from the north of Europe or from the south of Europe. And finally, a last example of uh, tree cloud is Nadel Jlochevrel for uh, one of the projects uh, supervised by uh, Gisèle Séjanger. Um, so we studied here uh, 168 texts written in the Revue des Deux Mondes in the 19th century, both by scientists and by uh, writers, by people of letters. And uh, those articles focused on uh, nature, natural sciences. And so we focused on the main words which appear here to know whether uh, scientists and uh, people of letters have a different approach to those concepts by again uh, building two clouds for uh, both cases, for both kinds of writers. Uh, I should also say that we did some methodological uh, paper with uh, Alex Sinas and uh, Noria Gala and ideas by Alain Genoche in 2012 uh, to see whether we could adjust the branch lengths, because I didn't tell you, but here the branch lengths are artificially of equal length. Uh, it would be more um, relevant to be more accurate depending on the data we use as input. If we used it directly in the most accurate possible way, it wouldn't be very readable, but we tried to find a compromise between the two in this article in French, and it was an opportunity for me to write, to summarize it in English in the, in the document uh, which I wrote for this uh, habilitation. Uh, now another topic about uh, chronological proximity this time. Uh, which I started with my delegation at LATIS. Um, because, uh, Olga Semank uh, was involved in a project, so she was a postdoc uh, hired for a project to study the idiolect of French uh, authors. Uh, so authors wrote a lot of books, lots of uh, novels, allowing to see whether there was a trend in the way they write, in their, we could say, style. But idiolect is a more uh, technical word to say style without aesthetic uh, considerations, let's say. Um, and so the idea is uh, um, the well, classical natural approach is to do a clustering of those texts, meaning we want to bring together the texts which are the most similar. We obtain this kind of tree, which reminds us of uh, the tree that we saw earlier. Uh, and we wonder uh, in, the same, in the same groups, do we have uh, texts with the same publication dates or with similar publication dates? Seems to be the case here with the last text on the bottom, the first text on top. And uh, well, the idea was to study this more in detail because actually this is on the bottom and this is on top, but I could represent this exact same tree by just mirroring it, for example. So is there a way to find the best order of the leaves of this tree matching the chronological order? And if it's the case, can it really perfectly match the chronological order? 
And so this, uh, actually this problem uh, can be seen in other fields. Uh, for example, in this uh, tree of uh, different states of the English language, uh, you see that here they didn't pay too much attention about the chronology, but in the, I mean, the drawing, because you have text from the 11th century on the bottom and 13th, well, 14th century here, uh, but in between you have later texts. Uh, but in, in the analysis, uh, we read today that there is some chronological signal, of course, between those four periods. So we could maybe display the tree a little bit better if we optimize it with chronology. Or in this case, for discourse analysis, political discourse analysis, with the speeches, the New Year speeches of uh, presidents in France in the last uh, 40 years. Uh, yeah, Jean-Marc Leblanc says in his commentary, well, you see that there is some chronological uh, signal, which can be shown here, but maybe it could be even more uh, visible if we put, for example, this edge, uh, if you order it here, and then it would be between the 70s and the 80s. It will be more clear that it's chronological. Well, uh, how can we study it more formally? The idea is to, well, let's start with this example. If we have text with those publication dates, you see that if I uh, exchange uh, two children here, I get a better chronological order, almost perfect. If I again reverse the last two, then I get the perfect, uh, the perfect order. Um, so, yeah, that's the example here, perfect order on the right. Uh, so the idea is how to do this kind of optimization. Sometimes it doesn't work perfectly. For example, here, I do it again. Now I can't uh, choose a, a perfect ordering, uh, even if I, well, if I try any possibility. If I want to keep my tree planer, it doesn't work. I have a, what I call a conflict. So in this case, what would be the best order to avoid all the conflicts, for example? Or uh, so what would be the criterion we choose for this optimal order? One criterion would be how many leaves do we have to remove to get the perfect order? And we saw that uh, 2019 was involved in the conflict. If we remove it, it's perfect. But we could also remove another one, 2018, which would still be perfect. And uh, actually, maybe this is not the best criterion because uh, I can show you other examples where, uh, for example, if I put 2025 here, uh, it's not the same to remove 2025 and to remove 2019. Here you see that 2025 is not below those ones. Uh, okay, it's, below, it's above the other ones, so that's fine. Whereas here, 2019 is more compatible with the leaves below. So, uh, Another way to evaluate how good the order is, is maybe to count the number of conflicts between all the leaves. For example, here we see that we have three in this order, and here only one if we have uh, another date instead. Um, so we can represent them this way, those conflicts, represent them as crossings. How did I build this? I just put the dates in chronological order. I put a link between two dates when they are identical. And I count how much, many times uh, we have crossings. If you know about permutations, you see that it's the inversions, the number of inversions in the permutation. Um, and so, yeah, so we have two criteria. One is the number of conflicts or inversions, and one is the number of leads to delete uh, to get the perfect order. And uh, so the two criteria are actually really different. We have here an example. It's the same tree on the left and on the right. But in this case, I've chosen the order to optimize the number of, uh, of leaves to delete, which will be seen next. Only four here. Uh, no, sorry, it must be three here. And here we need to delete four leaves. Uh, but we only have 10 conflicts. So this, this order is optimal for the number of conflicts. So this one optimal for the number of leaves to delete. Only three. Um, and so actually, this problem was studied before in bioinformatics uh, in different settings uh, when comparing trees. So instead of having an order here, we have a whole tree, but we fix the order of the tree. So it's exactly the same as having an order. And um, well, 
uh, in St. John who is online, uh, was one of the co-authors of uh, the paper of the finding the best algorithm known so far to solve this problem, which is called one tree crossing minimization when we want to optimize the number of crossings. For the second criteria, uh, the criterion, the one I showed first, um, this problem is called one tree drawing by deleting edges. And the people who first gave the theoretical study of the problem uh, reused another well known algorithm to solve everything set to uh, give an algorithm which depends not only on the number of leaves uh, on, on the tree, uh, but also on the number of conflicts. So you see, it's exponential on the number of conflicts. Uh, maybe not great, but surprisingly, those two. Uh, well, those words, which worked on binary trees, they didn't check if it was a hard problem or an easy problem on general trees, trees where nodes can have more than two children. And that's what we worked on with Laurent Bulto in particular, and Olga Seman for the uh, experiments and the end of the paper. Uh, we showed that it's empty complete in both cases when we are not restricted to binary trees when it's a general case. And uh, we gave uh, an easy algorithm for the for the first uh, for the first problem with uh, an implementation in Python, and uh, a kind of easy one as well, but a more involved one, which is uh, FPT. Meaning we uh, it can be slow, but uh, we kind of manage uh, to have a, a reasonable complexity if the maximum degree or even a parameter which is smaller than it is uh, small enough. Uh, again, we implement uh, uh, one of the versions which is fine for binary trees in order to make experiments. So these codes are available online currently. We are actually trying to optimize all this with uh, uh, colleagues from the lab, when we find Eric Cusy and Laurent Bulto, and Lucien Zhang again. It's uh, the Merlin project we're working on right now. Uh, so what does it give in practice for these uh, works by Zola? I see that we can uh, remove eight works and get this perfect order. Uh, but we can also see that there are uh, 30 conflicts with uh, uh, this order. So now, if we have such results, we wonder, uh, is this a small result? Meaning, uh, does it mean that it's close to a perfect chronology or not? Uh, so we have to interpret this number of conflicts or edges to delete. And there is a classical way of doing this so to know if it's really consistent with the chronology or if it's a number of threads or conflicts which could be obtained by chance. There is a, a classical way of doing this in uh, bioinformatics. It's something on PVD or private value, well, in statistics in general. Uh, so one way of doing it experimentally here is instead of uh, having the chronological order of the text, we generate 10,000 random orders if we have as many conflicts with all those random orders, it means that it's not that uh, particular. The chronological order has nothing particular for this tree. And so it's not, the tree doesn't really display a chronological uh, pattern, a chronological signal. Uh, so let's say an example. So concretely, uh, we put the tree in the new week format, which is classical again in phylogenetics. Uh, we start the program on 10,000 random orders. And in this case of, uh, of Zola works, we see that for random orders, we have uh, always more than 70 conflicts. So as we had only 30 conflicts, it's just uh, not, uh, it's not probable that it was obtained by chance. It's really extraordinary in some sense. And so we deduce that there is a chronological signal in this tree. Um, yeah, and, and uh, we, we actually we didn't do this only when we really wanted to uh, know whether there is a chronological signal for those authors and whether we can see what elements of their style evolves with time. Uh, we used uh, other more targeted analysis analysis like uh, regression. So um, the good uh, thing was that the best authors for this regression method which is a machine learning where we learn on three fourths of the works what is their date and we estimate what is the date of the remaining uh, one fourth of the works. Uh, well, it works well 
four tubercle cells where the tree had a, a small number of conflicts or of edges to be. And on the contrary, for all authors for which it doesn't work so well, in this figure, for example, we didn't work uh, either for, for our case. We could find random orders which had similar results for the group. Uh, so yeah, we published uh, this experiment, uh, uh, the whole analysis with uh, Thierry Corbois and Dominique Galois also, on top of Paul uh, in the Journal of, uh, uh, no, sorry, in the uh, Journal of Cultural Analytics. We also published the corpus itself, more than 400 novels uh, in text version of those authors, gathered from several sources uh, in a, well, I published it online, but we wrote a data paper about it to explain how people can use this data. Um, and so maybe yeah, some few words on Marseille de lorde because it's um, yes a good way of doing experiments in uh, digital um, humanities. Uh, it's a good way to have a, a favorite author and to study him or her in this case. Uh, it's one of the main writers of the 19th century. I didn't know about her uh, in 2017, uh, so it's normal if you don't either. But really, you should check the data gathered uh, from other projects, uh, Visiotrice and Cité uh, We see that it's one of the main three authors uh, from the 19th century uh, who are women, with uh, Georges Sand and Germaine de Stahl. Uh, so I discovered her actually during a proofreading challenge of the Wiki Source community, making available the text of books online. Uh, then I met Christine Planté, and it was a, was a discovery with other experts as well. Uh, she's not as much studied as other authors of the 19th century, so there is really uh, some there are really some stuff to some things to discover here, and a lots of challenges. For example, variance in her poems, even in the published ones. Here you see that between 1825 and 1830, she republishes some of the poems which were already present before. Uh, so this was built trying to find similarities between the text uh, in sequences of four words. So again, like uh, four grams we use for uh, in um, in bioinformatics sometimes. We can uh, repeat this operation between different editions of the poetry book, see how the order of the poem is changing. Here, each circle is a poem, and the arcs represent how they evolve inside the different versions of the poetry book. Um, so we can do this even on the OCR text, uh, because we still find enough similarities, I and mean, the text automatically retrieves from computers. But we also organize uh, wiki source workshops. We put them online, and I put the last two books that we managed to put online on uh, September 21st uh, during an event with a concert in Pantin, uh, with also the association uh, Le Deuxième Text. Uh, here I show you that um, it was a good opportunity for me to really look for texts, look for manuscripts of poems. Sometimes I have to, to check the auctions, you know, to find the uh, some uh, manuscripts uh, which are cheap or cheap enough <laughs> to buy some uh, letters or some poems of Marceline de Bord Valmor. Uh, I also try to preserve them and sometimes uh, uh, yeah, we sell them at a cheap price to the library in Douai, which is uh, saving most of them. And uh, where most of the manuscripts have been photographed by Delphine Mansen 10 years ago, before I joined the project. Uh, there are also lots of musical scores inspired by the poems. And here you have the first musical scores composed, well, known currently, composed on poems by de Lord Valmore. Uh, this was done in, 18, in 1807. And uh, only one of the three were known before I found this uh, uh, in a Belgian store. Uh, I also worked on translations of the poems. So in the database, there are currently 1,200 online. You have a Czech <laughs> book, for example, or a Japanese one. So thanks, uh, Google Translate, uh, to find an automatic translation and match it with the current poem database. And uh, yeah, more than 6,000 editions of individual poems that you can find on this website. And so it's a way also to be involved in the current uh, edition project of her work, of her poetry work. Um, I also wanted to say some stuff about uh, 
city walks in Douai, because we worked a lot on other city walks uh, with the City Dedham project. So this shows you that one was started by the city of Douai, and then we, in the City Dedham project, built this uh, application from the intern, Louis Gravier, to start a walk uh, discovering the cultural heritage of women. So here it's uh, all the steps related to Marseille without Valmore in Douai. For example, the statues which were there. Uh, you see that we also worked on uh, writers named Marguerite in Paris or writers named Marie Gournay in Paris. And we can see four old versions uh, of the map of the city uh, to see how it looked when the author lived there or uh, when she lived uh, and she came back to the way in these uh, ages. Uh, there is also some current work that I'm doing about uh, different uh, uh, variants on uh, the text by Marceline de Bordalmore. It's, here it's a short story, uh, which is known because uh, it was actually a translation of a short story in English, which was retranslated to English by someone else. And so the English translator was accused of plagiarism by the first one. <laughs> said, oh, no, I just uh, translated with the, with the right, of course. But here you see that there are lots of uh, translations, actually, uh, because this English version was again translated to French later. Uh, but we have also some theater versions, theater adaptations. And uh, it's a way of showing you that they, are all, they have already been which to find similarities between theater plays, for example, by displaying the character networks. This is from the Dramagraph project of uh, Obvious and now Optic by Frédéric Glorieux. So we can use this for uh, uh, a play written in English inspired by the English novel and a play written in French inspired by the French translation by the Valmore. And then uh, we see that some characters change names. Actually, depending on all the versions, we can see the main changes, which can uh, reflect that some were inspired by others. Uh, but uh, so when, when, when we when we make a summary of all the character names by the first letter, by a representative letter, we see that yeah, mostly the end of the two theater plays align in this in this way, meaning in terms of successions of characters. Uh, but actually, sorry, this is another example with another way to compute the distance with a tool written by an intern here. Um, and uh, we, we actually, when we don't know the matching between the characters of the two plays, well, we have to turn to Aaron Lucidon, who's finishing his portraits uh, about this. So, with a different model that you can use, either using um, or guessing the matches between the character names. Uh, trying to find similarities between succession of, of characters, uh, following renamings, or using semantic similarities between what the characters say, what the characters say during the play. And so we have already had the one publication at CPM last year, uh, so a more theoretical one, and a more practical one at GAA DT this year. And so, yeah, I wanted to say that this project on the Lord Valmore is a good way of uh, uh, of uh, first making the corpus of our works available, finding new manuscripts, uh, helping to build and preserve our cultural heritage, interact with specialists, and also, uh, currently, uh, lately, lastly, it was my first experiment of, uh, well, experience of uh, editing a volume of uh, uh, articles. It was very long, like three years, but finally the book was out, represented it at the Salon de la Revue. And we can uh, edit the next one for next year. So let's talk about the future of my work. Um, maybe first, let's summarize that what I showed you today is a set of works about proximity, similarity, and validity used on both or either in bioinformatics and digital humanities. Uh, often I try to find simple models to represent the reality and then to design frugal algorithms. I stole the term from a project by Gregory. I really like this idea of uh, yeah, being just efficient, not using you know, the huge uh, models, uh, clusters of machines, uh, and have uh, approaches which are efficient and easy to use for colleagues in literature, for example, on their, on their machine without having access to a server. Um, it involves a lot of interdisciplinary collaborations, also internship supervision. 
uh, I try to follow more and more the principles of open science and also to advocate for it in the university. And yeah, all the experimental tools I'm working are uh, yeah, accumulating and uh, uh, are useful to build scholarly editions. And so that's what I want to continue doing uh, in short terms or long term projects. So I'm still working on those variants of the pangogram problems. I don't find it, but it's uh, the way that various mathematicians see the things I showed you with the conversion between a tree and an order. Uh, then also develop new network tools using text. This is for the CWM2 project to analyze the circulation of women in cities and of their ideas in cities um, extracted from the text. Also, so being involved in this uh, edition of the Poetic Works by Marcelin de Bordalmar, also in the edition of her correspondence, uh, by also providing tools to the team. And in the long term, maybe producing algorithms, easy to use tools and approaches to find similarities, to analyze similarities uh, between texts, in our texts, or things which are close to texts, for example, musical scores on poems by de Bordalmar political discourses of the 17th century, and theater plays written by women, for which uh, I either have the corpus or the corpuses are being uh, built right now. And uh, finally, also, you know, building an open science and also collaborative uh, work, um, using data from the collaborative database, Wikidata, for NLP tasks, for example, uh, discriminating between homonyms, um, also trying to analyze the genealogical data which is here to represent it and maybe use deep learning in order to do this. Already have a few ideas that I would like to develop in the future years because it seems to be more and more difficult to avoid those uh, machine learning techniques. And so let's try to use them on uh, original data using original ways of exploring them. Thank you for your attention.